Okay, so now we start the CT portion of the program. And we're going to start with Jim Kofler giving us sort of a review of the principles and equipment design wrapped around CT. And this talk and the next talk will also be Sam's talk, so have your little thingy ready. Yeah, me too. I'm going to have it ready. All right, well, thank you. Uh, what an honor it is to be at the summer school. It's been a long time since I've been at a summer school, and it's been kind of a trip. Uh, I have a boy who just finished his first year of college, and I went to visit him a few times. And every time I went there, I look and see this small dorm room, and it's just trashed. There's clothes on the floor and papers all over, gadgets all around. I thought, how can he live like that? Did I ever live like that? I don't think so. Well, last night I went back to my room. I opened the door, and there's clothes all over the floor and papers everywhere and gadgets all around. And I think all I need is posters on the wall, and I would have it just like it including the, the bad influence roommate I have that kept me up too late last night. All right, we're going to talk about uh, some basic CT uh, physics here. The learning objecti objectives are to understand the fundamental concepts of image acquisition, image formation, know some basic CT scanner components and functions, and implementation and implications of multi-slice CT. Now, we've only got an hour to go through all of this, so obviously I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail on anything. But what I want to do is just kind of familiarize you with, the, with these basic concepts, kind of set up some information for some of the talks uh, later this afternoon and tomorrow. Okay, but before we get into that, I first want to give you my one-minute history of CT. Okay, 1917, Johann Radon mathematically demonstrated reconstruction of an object from multiple projections. Okay, quite a long time ago. Problem was that the equations were so uh, complex and complicated that it wasn't really practical to do them. Okay, and it wasn't until 1963 that Alan Cormack introduced the Fourier transforms into the calculations and actually made them possible. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, Johann Radon never realized this huge, significant a contribution he had to society, not just from CT, but it's applied in a whole cross-section of different sciences. And here I have to pause a little bit, because the next thing I would go into for my one-minute history of CT is one of my favorite trivia things about CT. And actually, people that talk and work in CT uh, tend to, to have this as one of their favorite things to talk about as well. But I recently learned something they kind of changed things on me. So I'm going to step through it anyway. We're going to walk through it, uh, and then we'll look at uh, what I've recently learned. So we had Johann Radon, we had Cormac, but with only a minor stretch of the imagination, you could say it all started with these guys, the Beatles. Okay, the Beatles made a lot of bees, and they sold a lot of recordings, and they made a lot of money for this company, EMI. Electric and Musical Industries. Okay. As the story goes, EMI decided to take this very significant uh, newly found windfall from the Beatles and invest it in an uh, engineer of theirs who was working on a kind of an interesting project. And that engineer was Godfrey Hounsfield. And the project, of course, was CT. Okay. And in 1979, Hounsfield, along with Cormac, won the Nobel Award for Physiology or Medicine. What a cool story that is, huh? The connection with this really interesting, neat technology and this uh, very iconic pop culture. The only problem was that uh, a couple buzzkill investigators decided to do some research and find out the truth. And what they found out was that there really was no evidence of a Beatles CT connection. In fact, EMI Music did not fund EMI Medical at all. This actually was something that I had heard ever since I've worked in CT. It's been around for a long time. And in fact, most of the funding came from the British Department of Health and Social Security. And so they published this paper appropriately entitled, Do We Really Need to Thank the Beatles for the Financing of the Development of the Computed Tomography Scanner? Uh, in a reputable journal, and that's kind of the end of the story. And the reason that I kept these slides in anyway was, first of all, to kind of mourn the last time that I'm going to get to use some of my favorite slides. 
but also to kind of stop the proliferation of this urban legend. In fact, there is no connection. All right, let's get on uh, to the course at hand here. Here's a CT scanner. On one side within the gantry here, we have an X-ray tube. I've shown the inset here. You can't actually see the X-ray tube, but you're seeing are the collimators there. There's usually a protective cover, uh, so you can't normally see that even. Opposing the X-ray tube, we've got a set of detectors as shown up there. You can't really see the detectors because there's a protective cover over those as well. And as we know that these rotate within the gantry, giving us different views and projections of our patient or whatever is sitting on the table. Uh, from different angles. Here's our coordinate system. We've got the XY plane is our scan plane, and the Z plane uh, is along the longitudinal direction, the direction of the patient or the table. All right, we need to define a few things. Our goal is to determine uh, attenuation coefficients within a section of the body, and so we're going to define a ray as one X-ray path, a ray sum or line integral as the total attenuation along one ray, and then we have a projection or view, which is a set of ray sums at a fixed angle. What I'm going to walk through next is just a graphical illustration of how it's possible to create a cross-sectional image of something just by looking at it from different angles. So we've got a very simple object here, a three-dimensional triangle, and we're going to shoot some x-rays through it. And if we looked at this from the top, it would look like that, okay? So we start, we shoot some x-rays through, we'll call this zero degrees. We have a measurement uh, beyond here of transmission or intensity or whatever. We could call it density, intensity counts. Just some measurements down there. And we can take those values, those numbers, and we could display them if we want as a plot. Or we could convert that plot into a grayscale. Okay, and the grayscale is really just for illustrative purposes. And the width of this grayscale it was just arbitrary. I wanted you to be able to see it from back there, so I made it about that wide. All right, so to create our image now, if this is the only data that we have, this is all we know about this image. So if we wanted to generate an image from that one projection, our image would look like this. That's all we know about it. Okay, typically you hear this referred to as you smear the data back well, you kind of do, but that kind of implies that you're smoothing it or smudging it or something. It's just the data set in covering the entire field of view, and this is called back projection. All right, so let's try a different angle. We're going to keep that in the back of our mind and move on to a little bit different angle. You see we get a different pattern. We're going to do the same back projection thing, and we are going to keep that in the back of our mind along with the first one and move on to the next one. Okay, there's three, and then let's put one more on. And there's four, and you can already see some kind of triangle forming there. Now, I'm not convinced that that triangle is actually that triangle. Okay, but you kind of see what's happening here. So if we look at, there's our four projections. If we add a few more projections, you see that something is coming out of this that is starting to resemble somewhat that object. Now, this was all drawn uh, by an unprofessional artist, me. And there's a lot of aligning and jittering and things to get it lined up. So there's a lot of air introduced just by me with this graphics program trying to do this. But one thing that's clear as we go from one to the other and keep going and our, our image is building up is that it's getting blurry. Okay, why is it getting so blurry? Well, it turns out that this blurriness is inherent in the back projection scheme. Okay, but there's something we can do about that. We can filter that data. And remember, that data isn't really a grayscale like I've shown it. We can draw it like that. It's just numbers. It's just signals. We can filter that, and we can selectively amplify the higher frequencies, and we sharpen it. So if we were to draw it, illustrate it, it would look like that. So in a sense, what we're doing is undoing the blurriness before the blurriness exists. This is done prior to the back projecting. Okay, it's not like a Photoshop filter where you just apply it to the image. This is done before the image exists. Okay, and this is called the reconstruction algorithm or the kernel. Okay, this is a little bit clearer because it was generated by computer. There's four views, 20 views, obviously a different object, not our triangle here. 
100 views filtered, 600 views filtered, and there's 600 views not filtered. So you can see the inherent blurriness caused